Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my talk today is going to be on artificial intelligence, which is a passionate area of mine, specifically because I think it's one of the most interesting areas of, art, of uh, information technology. So I was going to go through a, a bit of a, an outline there of, of uh, my speech, but I, I'll go straight into um, the discussion. Um, I just wanted to make a, a very point, important point at the very beginning, and that is that I think we are in, at an age at the moment, and I think you'd all agree, that the computer is indispensable in our daily lives. That computers are everywhere, whether they are in our handheld devices or in our vacuum cleaners or our cars, there is computing or microchips somewhere. And of course, since the advent of the mobile computing device, um, we've now uh, you know, exploded in the area of social networking and, and being able to be in touch with everyone at, at the click of a, a switch. So I would argue that uh, the, the people coming up now, the, the students that are coming through the schools, have way gone past the technology barrier, uh, the pain barrier of technology. Because basically, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, there were times where people would say, oh, another computer, another device in the workplace or, or in the home, that's going to do someone out of a job or it's going to have an, an ill effect on society. Um, and of course, now we've heard through some of the speakers previous to me today that uh, actually that's the opposite. It's, we're moving to a point where whether it's medicine, whether it's other areas of uh, life, we are now getting very much the benefits of the technology that uh, we may have been apprehensive about uh, decades ago. So the question is, have we overcome the fear of computers and, be, you know, and, and saying you know, it's the computer's fault when something goes wrong, or, or, or are we now realising that um, you know, we, we are, they're permeating our lives? Well, I think um, you know, some people may be okay with what, what things are, are doing right now, but uh, what about in the future when we have computers that actually go out and uh, talk to us uh, as another, as like, like they were a human being? And this is where we're, we're, we may be a bit frightened of that future. So for those of you who are interested in computing, put up your hands if you're interested in computing. Well, that's great. That's a reasonable proportion. Um, <laughs> and down the back there. Now, for those of you who have used a computer for more than just checking your email, doing the internet, or something like that, you will, you will see that it's actually um, a, really a device that follows instructions. Uh, an algorithm is a set of steps that will go from one to the next just executing and pretty much not doing it in any intelligent way. So if you've, even though you may see devices and computing, pr computer programs that are just amazing to use, they are just following instructions and pretty much sequential ones at that. So I would argue that probably the standard things that you use on a daily basis are probably not intelligent. So we have, of course, the, the concept of artificial intelligence. Now, artificial intelligence has many names, and I'm going to use that terminology today because some of you may be familiar with it through popular culture, through movies, or even you know, seeing the actual technology that's around today. And I'll go into some of those. So um, who doesn't know what artificial intelligence is? Put up your hand. Okay, there's, there's a few of you. Okay, so it's the artificial intelligence concept is getting a computing system to be very much or almost identical to a human in terms of intelligence. That's the dream. It's being able to get a computer device or, or a computing system to actually be able to walk, talk, interact, reason, and, be, and, and exhibit intelligent behavior. And of course, um, we, we already, some of you may have seen the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, which I think is one of the most iconic movies for artificial intelligence. And of course, that was done in 1968. So probably a lot of the people in the front rows here have got no idea about that movie and probably don't want to have any idea about that movie. But the interesting thing is it was, it was released a year before we walked on the moon as, as, the human, as humankind walked in, in space. And interestingly, um, 2001 has been and gone. And the sequel of that movie, 2010, has been and gone. And we still see the, the main star of that uh, movie being a computer that could talk, could play chess, was pretty much as, as intelligent as the humans that uh, controlled it, um, and could read lips and could do amazing things. Now, the, the interesting thing is that um, we're not even close to that yet in terms of where we are with artificial intelligence research. So um, I would argue that we're not there yet, although there are some very strong glimmers 
of really um, amazing discoveries that have occurred even in recent times. The Turing test, which is the test that was devised by Alan Turing, um, you know, 60 years ago, actually tries to get a computer to be able to be indistinguishable from a human. Once that occurs, um, and, and the test says that if the human can't tell whether they're talking to another a computer, but actually talking to a human being, then we've passed the Turing test, which is supposed to be the ultimate test for artificial intelligence. Um, well, guess what? We haven't even got there yet. So I, I'm going to share with you a little bit of, of the, the, the way forward um, with some of the, the advances that we have for trying to make what we could call an artificial brain, or perhaps, um, at the very least, uh, a system that exhibits intelligence to some extent. So we, we actually see that a lot of the artificial intelligence research is based on complex systems, and usually human or animal systems, um, from, from the animal kingdom or, or, or even from biological uh, evolutionary theory. So there is a very good reason why things are based in biology, because biology has got it right. Um, we, we are now at a stage where you know, the brain, the most complex object in the universe, um, is very difficult to replicate in, in more ways than one. So forget about trying to replicate the, the bare essence of it, you know, the, the circuitry, the neurons. What about trying to replicate what those neurons together do? Uh, that's something that we just have not really made significant advances in. So some of the, um, some of the, the you may not be able to see it uh, from, from afar, but the middle uh, picture there is supposed to illustrate a network of neurons. And of course, they can be neurons anywhere um, in, in the body, um, but, but specifically um, in the human brain is, is where we're looking at. Now, basically, the, that network of neurons is, is extremely, the diagrammatic version is very uh, simple, but the actual reality of it is that the, the network in the human body is extremely complex. And the, the most recent and, and perhaps successful advances have tried to replicate that to some extent. So the advances in artificial intelligence say that if we can use that as a basis, we can you know, get a, a, con a set of connections that are in software or hardware as opposed to being in the biological situation. So that, that is, is uh, you know, there's been some, some marginal success in that area from the perspective that we can actually see some computers and some software actually behaving intelligently. So what we see on the very right there is what we call an artificial neural network. It's but one tiny part of the area of artificial intelligence and it is one area that has prospered quite a bit in terms of replicating biological systems in the most simplest of ways, but actually getting results in real-world applications. So I want to talk a little bit about that. I want to talk about the, the grand idea of having a, a computer or a robot that can actually interact with humans uh, as if they were humans themselves. Now, that's, that's really still far off, but, but we have these glimmers, as I was saying before, and they, they do occur in areas such as uh, computer vision, where we have computers you know, seeing the world and actually being able to describe things and actually being able to solve problems. And, and uh, a lot of the areas uh, of the research that I've done um, has actually sat in that space of looking at digital video and image processing uh, along with artificial intelligence to give some outcomes. So a very simple example I'll start off with, it's probably the one I've, I've been dealing with for a while now, and you might ask yourself, um, automated handwriting recognition by a computer is, you know, hasn't that been done before? Well, it may have been done in the online mode, but the offline mode, that is, it's something that's written on a piece of paper where a computer tries to read it, and I mean an unconstrained piece of writing like a shopping list or a historical document with, you know, hundreds of thousands of words, that has not been done by a computer yet. Um, it's not possible to, to, for a computer yet to recognize fully unconstrained handwritten words. And I would probably say that in the audience here today, you probably have difficulty in trying to recognize at least one of those words up there out of the four. Now, it's interesting because um, it seems like a simple thing. It's handwriting. What could be so difficult? Well, it's the variability. It's the, it's the, the difference in, in the types of um, styles that we see. And, and that's why it's been a problem, would you believe, for the community for about 100 years, and we still haven't cracked it. So there are obviously huge applications for bank check processing, for postal address recognition, for forms processing, and of course, to the delight of the, com the teachers here today, um, for automated marking of exams. I mean, wouldn't that be great? You wouldn't have to read another exam paper ever again. The computer could do it for you. So the interesting aspect is that we're not there yet. Um, but I can say 
that we're, we're getting close in some aspects. And if we see here, I don't, I don't want to even pretend that I'm going to explain what that is, but I just want to show you that, that that is supposed to be the character A on the left-hand side, and I'm trying to explain in, in a diagrammatical fashion how that A gets interpreted by a computer. It needs to be broken down in terms of its structure. It needs to be broken down in terms of its basic components into numerical values so the computer can understand it. Now, although the diagram is, is pretty neat and, and can sit on one page, the actual concept of doing that and getting the computer then to be able to recognize that character alone um, is, it, you know, takes thousands of lines of code uh, in software. And of course, it takes some sort of, in inverted commas, artificial intelligence. So to give you an idea, they're already to, at, at this point in time, we've already received really good uh, you know, accuracies for being able to recognize individual cursive characters. That's characters out of cursive handwriting, which if you give it to a human, that is, if you give humans cursive characters outside of their context, where the, the characters are not joined to the adjoining letters, um, humans at best perform in studies that have been published about 85%. So we've got about to 90% in, in a computer to do that, which is pretty good. But that's for just recognizing characters. There's also applications in signature verification. This is very topical now because, you know, obviously there are, there are issues with contracts and credit cards. And so there is actually uh, a lot of work underway to try and get the ultimate signature verification system using artificial intelligence techniques. And so, you know, the, the type of things you would do, that hasn't come out well on the, on the slide, but the type of things you would do is go through and analyze the signatures and get, again, the process of being able to analyze shapes and, and strokes and get the computer to learn them and then be able to recall them. Okay, so where are we up with that? Well, we got, we, we've already received about 13% error rate on that, which is, which is pretty good uh, given that, um, you know, again, signature is extremely variable in the way that um, even we read them as humans. Now, I'd like to change gears a little bit, and I'd like to show you another area of application that I, I'm really enjoying at the moment, uh, which is the, the concept of processing video from beaches. Now, it's not exactly what you think. Um, it's actually being able to analyze beach video and scenes um, in the context for trying to recognize human behavior. But what do I mean by that? I mean actually being able to recognize humans in, as to what, whether they're running, walking on the beach, and how they're using the, the beach recreationally. This is a part of a project that we undertook with Gold Coast City Council and uh, Queensland Government, and also a company called Coastal Watch. It was to be able to deploy software that could actually do a lot of things actually on the beach, but one of them was, was looking at uh, behavior of people. Now, those images there, you can see the people are, are tiny and yet the computer is supposed to be able to recognize what those tiny little blips on the screen are doing. That's an extremely difficult thing to do with low resolution imagery. So we have to go through a whole lot of steps to break down the image and to get, you know, isolate the person out of it. And then we have, of course, the concept of, again, doing what we call feature extraction, which is extracting the important information so that a computer can understand it for training and ultimately recognition. So we go through a process of using a neural network, which I described very briefly before, again, to, to recognize the differences between, say, a human being and, say, a dog, a surfboard, or a piece of sand. Now, the type of accuracy we're getting with just detecting humans on the beach is about 85%. So that's being able to distinguish the human from other things. Now, of course, humans can be lying down, walking, they can be doing anything possible on the beach, and of course, that's quite difficult um, for, for a computer system to do. Now, of course, the really exciting thing is being able to do the concept of behavior detection. Now, the, the, one of my PhD students has done work in that area where he's detected people running, milling, or whether they're entering the ocean. Now, why is that important? I think it's extremely important because at the end of the day, wouldn't it be great if there was a piece of software that could assist lifeguards to pick out hazardous situations where humans are entering the water and are at risk of potentially uh, having something bad happen in the water? So a computer system, alert system would be an amazing thing, and we're, we're creeping towards that in our research. So already the, the work that's been done can, can put little, the little boxes you see, if you can, from the back there, are little boxes that are capturing the human and actually following it on the screen. And, that, and we can actually detect what they're doing and, and where they're going. And with that information, you can then also see if a person's entering the water. So that's extremely important uh, for an application in terms of safety. Another uh, application which I'd like to share with you that we've, we've worked on is in the area of um, 
detecting uh, abnormalities in, in neurons in, in the brain. So this is very interesting. You've got a neural network, which is an artificial system that is actually trying to detect the difference between different types of neurons in the human brain. So it, it's quite interesting to see machine analyzing the human equivalent. So what we've had to do is um, we, we had to do work that, that takes out the, the uh, information through, through 3D or video imaging and actually analyzes the, the uh, neuron and then goes and uh, distinguishes it between different types of neurons. There are hundreds of different types of neurons in the human brain and of course the idea there is to ensure that we, we can capture the slight variations over time to see if there's deterioration in the neurons in the human brain which could eventually be used to prevent um, disease. And at this stage, we're, we're not there yet, but we have got to the situation where a very complex network like that of neurons in the brain, we can isolate individual components, and then we can really put to the front uh, a neuron, uh, and actually then I segment that out of the very complex network of, of fibers, and then use a, a neural network to, to categorize it. So we've gotten about a 91% accuracy in that, and be able to distinguish between different types of neurons, and that's actually equivalent it's quite significantly higher than the, uh, than the human expert, which is about 72% that was used for the same data. And of course, there's, there's always a good conversation around you know, the human versus the computer performance. But I'd like to just finish up with um, just a, a real world example of artificial intelligence. Who banks with the National Australia Bank over here? All right, so have you seen any of this on, on the side of your internet banking? Now, this is what they call an online assistant. The online assistant actually is a technology that was developed by a company called MyCyberTwin, which was actually incubated here on, on the Gold Coast and actually now is based out of New York. It's a company that, uh, that it uses high IQ AI to go ahead and, and sort of uh, answer questions of the, of the National Bank customers um, with regards to issues pertaining to their uh, internet banking. Now, honestly, I have tried it and I tried to say, you know, um, how are you today? Um, and unfortunately, it's not like a normal teller where they actually respond with a friendly, courteous answer. It just said, what the hell are you talking about? And so you actually have to give it e exact um, uh, instructions. But the good news is that it is actually possible to give you those instructions totally automatically without the need of a human, good or bad. That's a good question. But the, the issue is that we already have artificial intelligence built into systems that you may or may not know about that you're using on an everyday basis. So what is missing from actually being able to achieve the building of an actual artificial intelligent being? Well, it really what we haven't had uh, happen very, very recently is, is being able to get an uh, artificial intelligent being to do everything. I can, I can show you examples of really good accuracy character recognition. I can show you accuracy in neuron classification and, of course, people in behavior detection. But guess what? None of those systems can do the other things, such as make coffee or, or you know, talk to you and have a conversation. So being able to demonstrate competency in a variety of areas is missing in artificial intelligence. And that's really difficult. And of course, learning from experience and developing, formulating new concepts is also something that the computer can't do yet. And, and that, of course, is something that is really one of the biggest barriers in moving forward for actually being uh, you know, totally artificial intelligent. That computers need context and background. They don't have that information yet. They can't yet be able to get look at the environment and extract information and then use it in an intelligent way, just like we can. And lastly, we are able to converse and have excellent communication and command of the human language. Guess what? That is not possible in a computer yet. The Turing test has certainly not been passed. So the future of artificial intelligence of course, well, it, it's always a little bit grey and fuzzy into the future, but I can certainly say that there, there already have been significant advances in intelligent systems uh, and robotics. But wouldn't it be great if we had a robot that could totally interact with the, their environment, have conversations with, with humans, and be able to gather whatever information they need to make decisions? That hasn't happened yet, but we're close. There's also the concept of um, digital flesh hybrids, and I believe there was a bit of discussion about that um, potentially earlier. The, the concept of cyborg implants, well, we already have that. You know, it's not something that already, that's happening in movies like Terminator. We do have computers already being embedded in our bodies for, for medical purposes and for enhancing our lives. And that can only get more and more. I mean, we might be able to see at the end of the, 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 end of the rainbow there that we, we could be 90% cyborg by a certain period of time. A full-scale brain has not yet been represented in real terms. That is, I'm not talking about what the brain can do, 
but the actual scale of a brain's complexity has not yet been represented in computing. The largest size that's been done yet, to my knowledge, is a cat's brain, if you can believe that, but a human brain has not. And that is one step closer, obviously, to being able to handle the complexity of a human brain, but what about the stuff that the human brain does when, when that complexity comes together? That's something that we're quite far away from. And of course, creative and emotional computers. Well, the last time you, you've ever seen a computer paint a painting that you, you've said and stood back and said, wow, that's as impressive as the Mona Lisa, probably you haven't experienced that yet, and you may not for quite a number of years to come. So this is something to think about when we talk about um, computing and artificial intelligence. We've got a long way to go, but we have achieved great things so far. So I'll leave you there, and I thank you for your attention.